So joining me is Ed Chamberlain from ITV Racing. So Ed, uh, first and foremost, it'd be remiss of me to not ask you uh, how you're keeping under this current circumstance. Uh, how have you been coping with COVID? You're very sweet to ask, Holly. Uh, compared to a lot of people, doing fine. Thank you. Family are all healthy, touch wood, with horrors happening all around unfortunately you watch the news and it's it's desperately upsetting and and very sad and from my point of view, it's a bit sad in my office now you can probably see on the camera that's the the background i yeah to present in my here and all around me i'm glad you can't see it is chaos and mess so i'm ready to broadcast remotely again if i need at ascot and kempton and it's pretty depressing but but uh, we're very lucky that sport is continuing, racing's continuing, and we feel a huge responsibility at ITV to keep it going, keep it going, keep it coming into people's houses, because for people mentally, particularly at the moment, sport has never been more important, and racing within that has never been more important, I think. Well, he's doing a great job, because I know everyone uh, in my house, anyway, is tuning in on a Saturday, and uh, we're looking Good. But just going back a little bit, so a former bookmaker and journalist, how did the presenting come around? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> Largely because I wasn't a very good bookmaker and certainly wasn't a very good journalist either. But I, I you know, youngsters, are, I'm often being asked, what should I do? How do I get into what you're doing? The answer is show, show you've got a good brain first, which I tried to do by reading politics, would you believe, at university. And from there, I applied to go on all sorts of different racing courses and this and that. And I was lucky enough to get on a BHB, as it was then, a long time ago, Holly, course that led to me getting into bookmaking. I didn't want to go into bookmaking at all. I wanted to go into race course management for some reason. I'm not sure why. And there were 12 of us on the course. And we each got sent to a, a different place for work experience. And I got sent to Ladbrokes to become a bookmaker, which to me was the end of the world at the time. I didn't want to do that at all. And my dad said, just do it for the two-week placement and then go and do a proper job. But of course, I went there and absolutely loved it. Apart from day one, I didn't like. I wore a suit. My mum bought me a new Marks and Spencer suit. I remember it well, not realising no one wore a suit. I was the only person in an office of about three and a half thousand people wearing a suit. So it was a bit of a baptism of fire. But I ripped really off my teeth in horse racing then. And I did a bit of crit then. I did that for three and a half years before I got into journalism. I did a startup betting magazine that very nearly, very nearly took off. It was called Sports Advisor. And to promote it, I, a little bit like you're doing now, I was thinking on my feet and I went on a show called Bloomberg Television on a Friday to talk about sport and the sports betting and the racing and the football for that weekend. And Sky saw me on that and thought he might make a presenter. God knows why, but they did. And I was given a screen test and I went there thinking, oh, I'm a journalist. I'm, I'm far too good for this. I don't need TV. So it was probably quite relaxed in my screen test, I suppose. And they said... Um, we'd like to offer you a job doing Friday nights and then Friday nights with Kirsty Gallagher it was so how could you turn that down and and that was the start and it snowballed from there and that's that was back in the 90s would you believe and then of course uh, you presented the on, on with Sky uh, the full SP I think it was called with uh, Jeff Keller um, that's right Miss Jeff and um, what was that like because obviously it's kind of you know um it, it was quite you know high point was you doing something like that I was thinking it, I didn't know what I was doing, if I'm honest. I, was, I never used autocue. I was just ad-libbing. And I did a few shows to start with. The Full SP was one of them. And at, at Sky, I was known as the Grim Reaper because every show I did got killed off. It was a disastrous start to my broadcasting career. I started on the Sports Center. That didn't last. Then I went on to, what did I go to next? 90 Minutes, I think I went to next. That didn't last. Then I went on to the Full SP with Jeff, the show you refer to, doing the sort of betting and opta stats and things. That lasted one season. So I killed three shows before I'd even started. And I thought, oh, no, what's happening here? Um, everything I touched turned to absolute dust. And thankfully, they saw something in me. And this was, we'd done, what, three or four seasons at that point. And I got a screen test to go on Sky Sports News to do the, you know, everyone watches Sky Sports News at some point. And they thought I used autocue on the shows I was doing. But of course, I didn't because I didn't have that ability. So I did my screen test for Sky Sports News thinking, here we go. This could be my big break. And it was an absolute unmitigated disaster. I went up to the boss's office, who I owe everything to, a man called Andy Cairns, who I owe my career to, really. And he said, I can't believe it. We thought you were going to be good. You were hopeless. I said, of course I was hopeless. I've never used autocue before in my life. So I did, a, I did sort of three months off my own back learning how to use autocue and then had another go. And they offered me a job after that. And then all of a sudden, 
having been a bookmaker, a journalist, all of a sudden I was then a sports news reader out of nowhere. So you've done it all, really? <laughs> Not really. I've done some things very badly, but I've been very fortunate. But listen, life's all about taking those opportunities. The one thing I think I have done well is when the door is opened, I've, I've gone steaming through it and put a lot of hard work in and made the most of those lucky opportunities I've had. Because once I got my foot in the door at Sky Sports News, I thought, right, what an opportunity I've got here. And I literally, literally threw the kitchen sink at it and gave it everything I had. And mm. thankfully, things got better and better from there from a career point of view. Well, you can definitely say the same um, about the racing because, of course, then 2017, you were offered the job as uh, the main presenter. So I suppose going from Sky Sports to that, what was kind of, you know, they're both so different, I suppose. But what, uh, what was that experience like? The initial experience was everyone thought I was completely and utterly stark raving mad, and bonkers, <laughs> because I was approached in January of 2016 when things couldn't have been going much better, if I'm honest, Holly, because I was doing arguably the best job in football, presenting Monday Night Football and Super Sunday. That was my big break, getting those two shows. Uh, didn't get much better than that from a football point of view. But as you can imagine from, from our discussion, you know, I had racing in my blood and burning away in the background is something I always wanted to do. But people don't move from football to racing. That just doesn't happen. It's never happened before and probably will never happen again because in this country, I'm sure it's the same in Ireland, football is everything. Yeah. Uh, football is a monster and racing is absolutely tiny. Yes. So I had to say to the guys I was working with, Gary Neville, Jamie Carragher and others, I'm leaving and going to work in racing because as soon as ITV offered me the opportunity, I wanted to do it. I really, really wanted to do it. I didn't think I would be able to because getting out of Sky and that type of thing was 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 not easy. But So the, the, the first experience was having to put up with people on the high street every day of my life saying, what earth are you doing? So it was in all the papers, you know, uh, moving from the Premier League to present horse race. <laughs> what, why on earth are you doing that? And I couldn't go anywhere with people asking me that question. But it's what I was passionate about and I really wanted to do. And it was, it was heart ruling head in many ways, particularly financially. Um, and... It was a baptism of fire. I left Sky after Leicester won the Premier League in May of 2016, immersed myself in racing for the next six months, which in hindsight was probably a bit of a mistake, actually. I didn't need to do that, but I felt like I needed to do that. And then the next chapter started on January the 1st of 2017 at Cheltenham in a monsoon, and it didn't go particularly well, if I'm honest. <laughs> it's, it, um, yeah, I don't know how to describe it. It was certainly a baptism of fire. It was didn't get a plan at all. I mean, you know what it's like to prepare. I prepared everything for this day. I've been preparing for it for months. I've done interviews with every newspaper, radio station, all, all sorts. It was built up to this big day. I'd prepared everything. I had notebooks. I had my iPad. And then everything got washed away. I had nothing. I went on air at 1.30, whatever time it was, on New Year's Day with nothing. I had a broken iPad and all my notes had washed away in the, in the pouring rain. So I said to myself, hey, you've just got to go for it. And you can't let people at home know that anything's gone wrong. So your legs can be going like this. And up, up here, I was cool and calm as I possibly could be. But it was, um, as A.P. McCoy said that day, he said, why have you swapped a warm studio with Sooness, Redknapp, Neville and Co. to stand out in the rain with me and Luke Harvey? And do you know what? I thought, what have I done <laughs> for, a, for a certain period of time? But I've loved it. I've absolutely loved it. I suppose, though, as you say, if the passion is there and it's what you want to be doing, like, you know, nothing really compares to it because you're just going to, as you say, you've used the expression, throw the kitchen sink at it and uh, you're doing a great job, as I say. But um, did you have a background in horse racing or, or horses? Like, did your family at all kind of have horses or was it just something that you kind of got weird interested in yourself? Never sat on a horse in my life, I'm ashamed to say, unlike you. I got into it, like so many people, I think that's going to be something we're going to hear about. And I wrote about it in the Racing Post the other day. In 20 years' time, you, you'll ask people that question they'll have got into horse racing during COVID because so many people are watching sport on TV at the moment to give themselves a boost and a lift. And so many people are watching horse racing. And hopefully that's youngsters as well who will say, I got into horse racing because I watched it during that pandemic in, in yeah. 2020, 2021. So I got into it purely just like so many people back then. A grandparent was mad about racing. It was my grandfather. I had a Scottish grandfather called Jock Burns, great Scottish name. And he absolutely loved racing, but he loved racing as a punter. He had his tote credit accounts. He played the ITV7 every week and I did it with him. I absolutely adored him. I worshipped him and I would do anything he did. He was, he was big into train sets as well. And that obviously I got hooked on that as well. But racing very quickly 
sparked my interest and the grand national kicked it off i do the grand national sweepstake for the family and it you know what it's like it's happened to you i'm yeah. sure it just snowballs when racing gets you it properly gets you and it got me at age seven and eight and just went from there really and uh, but it was rather than a horsey background it was the more i suppose the punting side yeah. of it and, and and listen watching it on tv and enjoying it that first got me into the sport and then i suppose you know being the on ITV, you know, when you have the likes of, of AP McCoy and Luke Harvey, Mix Fitzgerald and like the many others that you have on with you as well. It must be great though um, presenting with these lads, you know, they've been there, done that and they're a wealth of knowledge, you know, um, because they've been in the saddle and they know what those lads are going through, at, be it Cheltenham, Aintree, wherever you're presenting from. So is it kind of, would you learn things off them like, you know, from... Oh from yeah. Oh, big time. Which is why I said to you earlier, in that six months of 2016, where I was free, if you like, I'd, I'd left the football world earlier than I'd planned, but I immersed myself in racing because as a presenter, and this is something I train all the time, as a presenter, you've got to face the fact that no one at home is particularly interested in what you've got to say. It is not about you. It's very much part of my ethos. My job and all the best presenters get the best out of other people. So my job as the presenter is to get the best out of those guys you've just said there. Mm. Sir Anthony, Mick Fitzgerald, Luke Harvey, Ruby on the flat, Jason Weaver, and good presenters get the best out of others. You're like the referee. No one's interested in you. And I'm fully aware of that. And I actually enjoy that fact. So I don't ever really offer an opinion on ITV. And I don't really want to. Sometimes I provoke it. I spark it. I play devil's advocate. But I use my skill as a presenter just to make things flow and try and get the best out of other people. Try and spark AP, sometimes make him laugh or whatever it might be. Because those are the knowledgeable guys. Those are the guys at home. What they they want to hear from them. I'm fully aware of that. They want to hear from them, not Ed Chamberlain. So the role of a presenter is very important like that. Des Lynham, who you're too young to remember, was the best at it. The best at you hardly notice him at times. He just so smoothly just moved things from A to B and got the best out of others and had a warmth. A warmth and likability is a far more important asset for a presenter, in my opinion, than a font of knowledge and constantly wanting to get their opinion across. If you hear a presenter say, or ever hear me say, I think this. And I, I, I'm not a big fan of that. Um, yeah. I will never tip anything on ITV, really, and I, I will very rarely offer an opinion unless it's something away from racing, big picture stuff that, that I obviously do get involved in and with what's going on in the world at the moment. But I see my job very much as getting the best out of those guys you've just described and hopefully making them excel. And we've got a great stable of pundits. I think, you know, to think at, at Cheltenham, I'm going to hopefully, if Ruby can come over, touch wood, McCoy and, and, and Walsh are my equivalent from my old days of having Graham Souness would be AP McCoy, big picture, while the absolute detail and unbelievable analysis is, is Gary Neville, and that's Ruby Walsh, because he is phenomenal. And then I suppose, um, just while we're staying on the topic of racing, uh, Cheltenham and Aintree now, of course, fast approaching, and uh, I suppose just turn our eyes to the Gold Cup for a minute, and um, Album Photo is going back now uh, to try and defend his title for the third time. Uh, no stronger a team in Willie and Paul, of course. But um, I suppose the big question is, in your opinion, I know you don't like giving your opinion, but in your opinion, <laughs> in your opinion do you think Good line. Can... Say that again. Sorry, I was laughing about what you said. You're laughing. <laughs> do, I... do, do you think he can do it, uh, Album Photo? Yeah, of course he can do it. Yeah. I think the one sadness is, in, in many ways, we've got a horse here who who is got a bid at history, a bid at something that gets done so infrequently. Best mate, obviously, the last to do it. Yet, I don't know what it's like in Ireland, but he gets no column inches here whatsoever. He hasn't captured the imagination at all for a horse that's won two gold cups. Whether that's because of his name hasn't attracted people's imagination, whether that's because we never see him, I'm not sure, or whether he's a horse that is just really good, but isn't particularly flamboyant, isn't a brilliant jumper necessarily. He's just a damn good horse. Can he do it? Of course he can do it. But it's such a difficult thing to do and he looked good the other day at Tremor but you'd like to think there's something there that will give him a real test this year Santini again from last year whether it's one of the new brigade who knows uh, whether it's a horse from his own state um, he's going to be very very difficult to beat um, I think in a, a year's time he might have a stable mate who's going to give him a real something to think about in Monkfish who I think is going to be very very good but can he can he win a third absolutely he can is it a shame it doesn't get more publicity and we'll do our best in the build up to march absolutely because to win three gold cups that's immortality and then i was just looking here i just had the 
here in front of me. Um, I know it's probably not a Gold Cup contender, but Frodon, just to go back to Kenton there, Christmas, Frodon and Bryony being uh, the King George, such a huge achievement um, for Bryony, fair play to her. But um, what was it like, I suppose, being there? And I, I know there was no crowds there, but like the atmosphere around, you know, the winning, because obviously, you know, I think it, it, it needs to be marked that like it was a brilliant achievement for both Paul Nichols and, and Bryony. Yeah, well said. It really was. What's it like being there? It's 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 desperate. There's no other way to say it's desolate. It's desperate. It's so hard to. It, it's flattering in a way, Holly, that our our shows are judged as being like normal shows because they're not. Because we're working with a skeleton team of, of ITV. We're working with no ITV HQ, as we call it, where normally the VTs and the features would be made. We haven't got that. We're all working remotely, effectively. And at the race courses, we've got nothing to feed off. We've got no crowd. We've got no people. We've got nothing to feed off at all. It's been really hard. And you get very down about it at times as the presenter. But you can't afford to do that because people at home, it doesn't look any different. I'm, I'm, I learned my lesson at the Derby, which just felt awful. It's the worst experience I've had in sport. An empty Epsom with security guards around the, the boundary and then this weird Derby. And I, I felt but it didn't look like that at people at home. You know, it's a normal Derby to them. You don't notice there's no crowd. And people hate it when I mention the fact there's no crowd there because people want to enjoy it at home like it's normal. And racing is a massive advantage like that. It seems like, like normal. So was there a buzz around the King George, if, I, if I'm honest? No, when you're there. But we've got a great story because I've championed Brani for a long time and I get criticised for it. But it's not, she's the 15th best jockey in the country at the moment in the table. Yeah, fine. But she does so much for this sport. She'd be second on the list behind Frankie Dettori and where she takes this sport. I always try and get racing on daytime television on ITV. It's almost impossible. And yet Brani does it at the drop of a hat by winning a King George. That is the power of Brani Frost. I'm not saying she's anything like as good a jockey as Rachel Blackmore. She's a damn good jockey. She's a brilliant asset for racing with that personality and the way she speaks, which as you're reading in the papers, I'm sure causes her problems, really, because I'm sure there's a bit of jealousy around. Some don't like it. But as far as I'm concerned, as someone who tries to promote racing and get new people into racing, to get youngsters into racing, there's no one better than Brani. She inspires so many people. We've seen it twice now. The golden hour at Cheltenham when Frodon won the Ryanair was the best hour of television I've ever been involved in. And then for her to go and win a King George like that was just, it, went, it overshadowed poor Paul Nichols. He'd won 12 King Georges. Brani was the story because outside of racing, she resonates. She resonates with young and old. And ITV viewers absolutely love her. Hence, she was on the front and back pages of the newspapers. And that, for me, with what I'm trying to do with the sport, is absolute manna from heaven, Holly. It really is. No, oh, she's absolutely brilliant. And just to, before we uh, we finish up, last year, can you give us a highlight? I know it was a bit of a, a miss sort of year, as in there wasn't really <laughs> there. Is there a highlight that you can take from 2020? Or is it kind of all guns blazing trying to go into 2021 now? Uh, it's a year you want to put behind you, to be honest. I mean, the hardest bit was broadcasting in this little room, which the Sun called my box room. <laughs> uh, broadcasting a 1,000 and 2,000 guineas, honestly, would be, I'm not sure whether it's a highlight or a low light. It was the most extraordinary experience. Um, obviously, there was no Grand National. And from there, I think my highlight of the year would be, I think the best race we broadcast was the Sussex stakes at Goodwood. Uh, Mahatha winning that, that was a great race. It had the lot. But in terms of a highlight of the year, when you take into account the big picture, I think I'd have to say Gold Cup Day at Royal Ascot because that was the first big sporting event back on TV. We yeah. had a huge responsibility because the country was suffering and the world was suffering massively. And there we were at Ascot, not in our usual regalia, in, in shirt and tie, trying to get the tone right. And we themed oh. each day and and the Thursday, Gold Cup Day, we themed as NHS Day. So you can imagine how important that was for NHS workers and key workers. Very powerful. And we had the gospel choir singing us out. We had Frankie Dettori winning the Gold Cup on Stradivarius. I think we had Damien Lewis coming on talking about his love of racing. I think we made a show there we, we could be pretty proud of. I'm a fierce critic of what we do on ITB. But that, for what the car country needed at the moment in terms of a bit of sensitivity but also as a pick-me-up if you like i'm not sure we could have done too much more there we we threw a lot at, at royal ascot in very very difficult circumstances and i think, I think gold cup day would be to explain how difficult it is to broadcast uh, in those circumstances but i think that's a show i think we're pretty proud of and and, and 
And that's down. Not, nothing to do with the presenter and the guys in front of the camera. That's all to do with the technicians and the people behind the scenes at ITV that made a show of that importance and magnitude happen in almost impossible circumstances. So the highlight of an awful year, let's be honest, a really difficult, horrible year, I think would be the Gold Cup there at Royal Ascot. And when you go back and watch Pixie Lot sing us out with the images of that, Royal Ascot, that, that honestly, honestly gets me very emotional, actually. Um, I've got it on my Instagram every time I watch it uh, quite often actually and oh my goodness that brings back a lot it was it was it was quite a week well let's hope that 2021 it can bring us some more memories and uh, hopefully crowds get back to racing as soon as possible when um, this all gets under control but um, until then thank you very much Ed I really appreciate you coming on and stay safe and hope you see you on race course soon absolutely it's an absolute pleasure thank you Holly